Welcome, GopherCon. I'm so glad to be here to tell you about Go for information displays. We all know Go is great on the back end, and you hear lots of stories and talks today about that. It's been called the language of the cloud, but sometimes you got to make a picture. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about information displays. We'll do it with a tour of packages and tools. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. And we're going to talk about how Go is great for this. So when we talk about information displays, let's think about the experts. Edward Tufte talks about displaying data for precise, effective, quick analysis, using things like small multiples and optimizing the data ink ratio, and creating visual and beautiful evidence. The renowned illustrator Nigel Holmes talks about designing for the context, where the data visualizer says, what's the data? And the information graphics designer says, what's the story? That's their definition. Here's my simple one. An information display is an interesting arrangement of text and graphics designed to convey a message. But before we get into that, let's talk about my motivation for doing this kind of work. I was very frustrated with graphical tools and pushing the pixels around to get the effect that I wanted. And I realized, and I felt like this guy pushing the rock up the hill, and I realized that programs are so much better at it. And I feel privileged to be able to have, be a programmer, and Go helps me write those tools to do the effects that I want. Because I needed precision, efficiency, and consistency. And I couldn't get it with the tools that I had. Fatih, who you guys know as the author of Vim Go and other things, talks about this, where he talks about knowing your tools and not letting your tools block you. But if the tools are not good enough, it's time to write your own. So that's what I'm here to talk about, writing your own. Here are the tools we're going to explore. There's three of them. SVG Go, which does scalable vector graphics, which is the web um, standard for 2D graphics. OpenVG is a C wrapper for the Raspberry Pi, and DEC, which is a presentation program. So let's start with SVG Go. SVG Go does one thing, it generates SVG to an I.O. writer. But before we get into that, consider BugDroid. You may know BugDroid as the cute mascot for Android, but when I see him, I see what makes him up. He's made up of lines and rectangles and arcs, circles and colors, round wrecks and scales. When you finally realize all of the information displays that you see are made up of these elements and you can program them, you have superpowers. So let's get into the API of SVG Go. Every method corresponds to an element in SVG like a rectangle and a circle. And you think in terms of where they are on the screen and also their dimensions. If you do nothing, you get the unstyled version here. With Go, you've got variadic arguments. You could just drop CSS in to style it. And if you need further control over those attributes, you can put them in individually. So you see there's the call, there's the XML, and there's the result. This is the hello world for SVG Go. Again, you think in terms of your canvas is where are you going to put your graphics, in this case, standard out. You specify your width and your height, and between start and end, you think in terms of your rectangle, circle, and text. SVG Go comes with a program called SVG Play. Think of Go Play with pictures. And this is a really powerful paradigm when you're designing and you're trying to work out your display. You've got your text on the left, your result on the right, and just by tweaking a couple of things, you can change and figure out and do sketching with code. This is very, very powerful. And because it lives on an I.O. writer, it's very easy to put your graphics on the web. This is a simple website I put together to explore that. You can just grab these particular pictures, change a couple of parameters, and change their behavior. But it's all about changing data into a picture. 
in this case XML, it could be CSV, JSON, whatever. This is shown by this particular example, a bar chart program. So you've got elements that specify the bar chart, and then you've got the picture there. It also works with other people's data, i.e. APIs. The package also comes with a program called Flickr 50, which you just give it a keyword. It calls the Flickr interestingness algorithm. Give it the URL, get the XML back, boom, there's your poster. Let's do a quick tour of some SVG Go clients. This is one of the first ones because I was creating diagrams like this, and I got very frustrated, and I again wanted that precision and consistency and efficiency, where you specify the elements and the connections between them and things drawn out for you. This is a visualization of Go benchmarks, a visualization of Go structures using Dominic Hanif's struct layout program. Again, here you see a pattern of pulling data from other places and pushing it into a program to get your visualization. Timelines, Stephen Fuse bullet graphs. Where I work, we tend to put these things on two by two grids and I needed a program to do that. Layouts and, and roadmaps. This is an example of that roadmap where it looks at technology adoption in terms of effort and impact. This is the linear version. But you can also, with the same data representation, have a radial version as well. Purchases versus stock price, Twitter update frequency, just playing with what's the scale of the solar system. This is an interesting one. This is Layer Tennis posters. Layer Tennis is a contest put on by Adobe where you pit one designer against the other. They start with one picture, volleys it to their opponent, back and forth and back and forth, and then you get a, a winner is declared. So these are three posters from the layer tenor season, but you can also lay out the entire season, culminating in the championship round on the last row. These are shot charts from the NBA. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the carpet pattern from the movie The Shining. When I see patterns like this in the world, the first thing I think is, how can I program that? How can I build that? Turns out it's actually pretty simple. You specify the definition of the object. That becomes your unit object. You perturb it a little by translating it and rotating it, putting it in a loop, and there's your pattern. The next tool I want to talk about is OpenVG. OpenVG is a wrapper to a native C library that comes on the $35 Raspberry Pi. This thing has a GPU in it with accelerated 2D graphics. These are the clients for that, kind of things that you might want to build. Here's its hello world. Again, the same kind of idea in that between a, between a start and an end, you think about your background colors and your circles and your texts. And these are the functions from that. Again, you'll start to see a pattern in that you've got these higher level functions that a designer might think of in terms of circles and ellipses and arcs and curves. This is a program using that API called TWH. TWH stands for Time, Weather, and Headlines. The weather comes from Forecast.io, and the headlines come from the New York Times or Hacker News. When I built this, I wanted to make one of these magic mirror things, and yes, that's me at 3 a.m. <clears throat> Here's a tabletop version, but this is actually where it landed, as a so-called information radiator on my kitchen wall. It automatically gives me this information any time of the day or night, and there it is. This is kind of the canonical information display. How's it work in Go? Go allows you to set up tickers that will go off one minute, five minute, and 10 minutes for the date, the weather, and the headlines. And as each of those fire, they update their associated area on the screen. You never see this, you just got a constantly updated display. The next thing I want to talk about is deck. Obviously, you're watching a deck presentation right now. 
that gives a presentation for doing, a uh, package for doing presentations, but when I put it together, I finally start, started to realize it also can be used as a universal canvas for all kinds of things. I wanted the deck markup to be simple and last a long time, but also presentations are both a project and a performance. And I put this stuff, I want this stuff to be GitHubable. So this presentation is on GitHub, so send me PRs and issues if you find something you don't like. Here's its hello world. Again, you, it's an XML markup. Between the deck elements, you've got a slide, one slide per page, and you've got text and graphics. This particular view shows every element. There are 12 elements in the deck markup. Again, that's one of the things I wanted to stress is don't have too many things. Have something that will stay in your head. So you've got the deck markup, the slides, and elements for text, images, lists, and graphical elements. This particular markup makes this. How's layout work? It's on a percent grid. Everything is on a percent grid, absolute positioning. And it has a nice property in that you only have to remember numbers from 0 to 100. This is what, how layout might work. But that also has the interesting capability that it will scale to the canvas. You can have different kinds of canvases, and the layout will automatically scale. But the important thing is you can generate deck layout by hand, or you can have other programs do it. There's all kinds of data in the world. And if you can generate deck markup, which I like to think of as kind of an assembly language for the universal canvas, you can generate it and then have be, show it as PDFs, pings, SVG, or OpenVG. This is facilitated by the deck generate package. Again, there's this notion of these higher level functions. Here's for text, code, and lists, and here's for graphical elements. Think about now when you put presentations together, you'll use PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides and you're poking at things. What if you had a program that will generate the slides for you? That's what this is illustrating. So you specify where the stuff is going to go. In this case, I'm going to spray it to standard out. Between start deck and end deck, start slide and end slide, you do your work. Here's an example of text layout. Again, you only have to remember numbers from 0 to 100. This is using string slices, obviously, to create your bulleted lists and also do a little bit of styling on it. This whole idea of having a hero image with some in, um, automated text is an interesting graphical um, view that I like. And here's one how you would do that there. So think about, this is a presentation that I put together about design. But think about it in terms of the higher level things, in terms of title slides and captions and sections. Then you can automate the presentation of that just by running it through a program and generate your slides automatically. By using shell functions, you can create a little language for creating these kinds of displays. So the same one that I showed you before is generated by this script. This also means now that your presentations can be scriptable. Deck also has a web API where you can put your presentations on a server and you can delete them and show them. And that same display on my kitchen that shows headlines and so forth can also show fine art displays. This is Rene Magritte. So let's go through some design examples real quick. So again, when you're thinking about your canvas, you can think in terms of its regions, the top, a bottom, and a left and a right. Then you think in terms of what are the proportions of those things, 10%, 30%, 70%. And then semantically, what does it mean? A header and a footer and a summary and a detail. Given this design, you can pour content into it, like this one, or this one, or something you might see at an airport. Again, this is kind of the canonical information display. This is one that I saw on a flight that I was recently on, and I said, can I program this? And this is a question I usually ask myself, and the answer is yes. 
It's very easy to use those basic elements to create these kinds of information displays. Stock prices. And here's a program that actually does that. So usually you, you'll put things in functions, obviously, to do the work. You'll specify some dimensions. You'll go through a loop for the stock symbols, grab the data from the API, make some decisions. If it's green, it's positive. If it's red, it's negative. And then lay out the data in columns. Nigel Holmes talked about being an illustrator. And then when I see quotes and things like that, I often say, what's the best illustration of that idea? Here's an example of one. Here's an example of looking at another way to look at Go documentation. Or the Go proverbs. I had fun with this one, trying to illustrate them. This one is my favorite. And there's probably a, an opportunity to have t-shirts for things like this. I'm also interested in things like book design and classical um, typography. So I looked at the Alice in Wonderland, including the, the tail kind of layout. Can I do that in DEC? The answer is yes. For my own work, I wanted to illustrate SVG Go examples. So I wrote a program called Code Pick DEC, which reads the program, runs it, creates the image, and gives you pages like this, kind of a mini CMS, if you will. Again, there's this notion of text and picture. And this is when I realized it's not just about presentations, it's about whole documents or document libraries, that notion of the universal canvas. Again, another illustration of something that piqued my interest. I'm also a Kubrick fan. So this animation you'll probably recognize from the, image, the movie 2001. That was done with DEC. Finally, all presentation programs need a charting package. So I built one that, that will generate the DEC markup, a program called DChart. And here's some examples here. There's 11 kind of chart types. But the, here's is the interesting idea. You can start with the simplest data representation, name value pairs or CSVs. That will be optimized and read by DChart, turning it into DEC markup into a PDF. Here are all the options. There are a lot of options. But you tend to use them sparingly whenever you need it. And you want to have good defaults. So if you just give it some data, you're going to get a bar chart like this. But if you want to change some things, you selectively add them with the flags to turn it off. So you can change things like titles, axes, grids, and so forth. And also the scale as to where they go on the canvas. This is an example of just showing how easy it is to just generate the data. This is a sine wave. This is how it could be interpreted with dchart. And just by changing a couple of parameters, you can change its style. But you can also do composites. In this case, I'm plotting both the sine and the cosine on one particular display. This is shown also with stock performance, showing the closing price and the volume. Again, this data is coming from CSVs, and it's automatically generated. This is, an, uh, again, another illustration of um, an article that I saw, and again, trying to tell the story of what it's all about. This final one I got from a visualization website that talks about the evolution of baby names from 1880 to 2015. This is one view of that data, the Amandas and the Ashleys and so forth. But here's another view of the same data, again, using Tufty's small multiples. As you can see, the Ashleys are big in the last part of this century. The Bettys have died out. But Linda peaked at mid-century. So there's all kinds of displays that I've just shown you. But what is it about Go that facilitates this? 
First of all, things that the, in the standard library, FUNT is really, really useful for generating these kinds of codes. FUNT is my favorite Go keyword because that's when I get excited. I'm going to have the behavior of the graphic encapsulated in those functions. IO Writer and IO Reader are superb for allows you to spray your graphics everywhere and to read from anybody's data. NetHttp allows you to talk to anybody's web API, and you've got encoding XML, JSON, and CSV to read that data. Sego allows things like OpenVG. But there's also the community. I'm indebted to the community for packages that I'm able to build upon. For example, the GoFPDF program. And also encouragement from the community. This is an email that I got from Russ Cox eight years ago when I was first starting and playing with SVG Go, where he says, are you going to share the library or just tease us with pictures? This email was just the impotence that I needed to share the library and continue on this journey. But thinking about that, I started to go back to things like the evolution of Unix, where Thompson, Ken Thompson wanted to create a comfortable computing environment constructing according to his own design, using whatever means were available. This is also echoed by Rob Pike, where he says, Go is not the product of a Whiggish development process. We were just trying to get something that worked for us. And to me, it's all about making tools. Being a developer and Go facilitating that is a privilege. I'd love to have everybody have that superpower to be able to make the tools that fit the way you want to work. And having a lot of fun doing it. I've been using this, again, just sort of my own um, enlightenment and just be able to make the pictures that I want. But it's all about reducing the distance from the idea that you have in your head to the picture. Finally, let's take inspiration from these two guys. Picasso and Turing, who represent the art and the code to be able to build beautiful pictures and information displays. That's my time. Thank you very much.